Greetings, people in front of the Chaos to West stage. Welcome to the next talk. Maybe you have the time to just fragment a little bit, as you know from the other talks. This, uh, by the way, is a... Uh, what is this? Ah, self-organized sessions. So if you have a topic or a kink or something you really, really want to talk about, feel free, contact me or my team. Actually, the team and me. Um, we do have a few slots. And um, we are looking forward to set you up, give you a little stage for your project and everything. Then... The next talk is about BISC. It is a uh, decentralized Bitcoin exchange. And uh, the man to my right, who is a little <laughs> stressed, has a great name. His name is Chris Beams, like laser beams. It's going to be a good talk. Amazing. I love that. OK, hello, everybody. So we're going to talk about BISC, one moment, there we go. We're going to talk about BISC, which is a decentralized Bitcoin exchange. Uh, that's me. I'm a co-founder of the project along with Manfred Kehrer, who's in the audience here today as well. Uh, let's say a little bit about what BISC is first. BISC is a decentralized peer-to-peer -peer Bitcoin exchange. It's best described as follows in terms of its major component parts, which is one, BISC is a cross-platform desktop application. It allows anybody to buy and sell Bitcoin uh, in exchange for national currencies, right? That's something that not many exchanges do that are decentralized uh, for national currencies and other cryptocurrencies. Two, uh, BISC is a trading protocol, and it enables individuals to exchange directly with one another over the internet eliminating the need for trusted third parties uh, to be in the middle of exchange transactions. Third, BISC is the peer-to-peer -peer network formed by all of these BISC applications, all these BISC clients working together, connecting with each other, implementing the BISC trading protocol with one another. The BISC network is fully peer-to-peer -peer, uh, in that it requires no centrally controlled servers and it has no central points of failure. So, BISC is a desktop application, a trading protocol, and a peer-to-peer -peer network that all work together to form a decentralized Bitcoin exchange. Uh, BISC is AGPL licensed, so it's free software, free software for free people. Uh, so let's talk about why we built it. Why does this exist? Our mission is to provide a secure, private and censorship resistant way to exchange Bitcoin for national currencies and other cryptocurrencies. When we say secure, we're talking about the safety of your funds. Today, most Bitcoin exchanges that you use are centralized. That requires people to store their Bitcoins on centralized services servers, putting those Bitcoins at risk. And even if you're doing this just for some short amount of time, just as long as it takes to trade and then withdraw your funds, Thousands of people are doing that at the same time, and that creates extreme incentives for those servers to be hacked and for those Bitcoins to be stolen. And this is exactly what happens time and time again. The beatings have and will continue so long as people continue to do it wrong, right? This is antithetical to the way Bitcoin works. These hacks are tens of thousands of dollars worth of Bitcoin, hundreds of thousands, sometimes hundreds of millions of dollars worth of Bitcoin, like in the very famous case of Mt. Gox. Uh, incidentally, not incidentally, not coincidentally, uh, BISC's first prototype showed up just a few weeks after Mt. Gox failure. So, security, right? Privacy, when we say private, we're talking about users' ability to control access to their own information. So today, most of those same centralized exchanges require users to divulge personally identifying information in order to set up an account, and then they in turn link that data, link that data about users, about you, with your trading activity. This practice creates extreme risks too, uh, in that your personal details 
and sensitive financial information can be stolen, leaked, or otherwise used against your own best interests. We don't have to look any further than uh, recent news, right? You know, not Bitcoin related, but we probably have all heard about Equifax. L literally half of all of the people in the United States, more than half of the adults, being, uh, you know, doxxed, right? 143 million people's personal data, very sensitive personal data being, uh, being hacked at Equifax, right? Literally every single Yahoo account was hacked recently. Uh, and this one, people who know Bitcoin will know well, uh, you know, the IRS, the financial agency in the U.S. Uh, came to Coinbase a couple of years ago and said, basically, we'd like all of your data about all of your users. And uh, that's not good for them. It's not good for users, right? So secure, private, censorship resistant. So when we say censorship resistant, we're referring to users' ability to voluntarily trade with one another without interference from any third party. Today, centralized Bitcoin exchanges are highly susceptible to that censorship. By their nature, they have to operate in one legal jurisdiction or another. That puts them at risk of being fined or shut down if they don't comply with the laws and rules of that jurisdiction, which may include and usually do include restrictions on who can trade, what can be traded, and almost always include requirements to collect personal information as I described above. So these are bank secrecy laws, anti-money laundering laws, know your customer laws. These are almost ubiquitous. And this means that when you're signing up for these uh, centralized exchanges to exchange Bitcoin, you're having to give copies of your passport, your electricity bill, all kinds of sensitive information that does you no good to share. So, and again, we have to we don't have to look any further than, uh, you know, recent news in, in Bitcoin this year. Many people have probably are probably familiar with the stories of China shutting down, banning exchanges, all kinds of madness, right? So, so governments can do this. They can, they will. This is the kind of censorship that we're talking about. And this is why we built this the way that we built it, right? The only way to achieve all of these uh, uh, properties that I'm talking about, secure, private, and censorship resistant, is to be decentralized, right? We don't build things decentralized just to do it. That's way harder than building things centralized, right? This is all for a reason. So let's talk about how BISC works. Here it is in a nutshell. Uh, let's just imagine a scenario. You want to buy some Bitcoin, right? And you want to do it in exchange for euros, let's say. So in BISC terminology, you're a buyer of Bitcoin looking for a seller of Bitcoin who will accept your euros as payment. So to complete such a trade using BISC, you'd follow a series of uh, steps similar to the following. First, you download it, right? So you go to our website, you download BISC, you'd install it, and you'd run it, just like any other application that you'd run on your, on your desktop, right? The second thing is that you'd configure BISC with your Euro payment account details. Now, this might look antithetical to what I just said. Here you are typing in personal information, information about your bank account. Well, keep in mind, this information isn't going anywhere. This lives locally only in BISC until the time that you choose to take a trade with some particular county counterparty. Then and only then is this information shared with that counterparty so that you two, purely peer-to-peer, -peer, can settle that trade with one another. So the third thing is that you'd then go look through BISC's offer book and you'd see, well, what existing offers are out there to sell Bitcoin? You want to buy it. So who's, who's out there that already wants to sell? And maybe you find an offer that you like. And if you don't find an offer that you like, then you could create your own. But in this scenario, let's imagine that we take someone's existing offer to sell. Okay, so you take it and you agree in this case to buy 0 0.1 BTC, right? 0 0.1 Bitcoins from the seller in exchange for about 1,200 of your own euros. The next steps are that BISC is going to orchestrate or coordinate the process of you, the buyer, and your counterparty, the seller, working together to go through a manual process, right? BISC is integrating with essentially a legacy set of systems, legacy banking systems, if you like to think about it that way, and they're not very modern. It's not easy to automate sending euros through a banking system. 
means you're going to have to log into your banking website and click buttons, right? So BISC is going to help orchestrate that process, but BISC isn't going to do it itself. So this is what we mean when we say that payments happen out of band, right, or out of system from BISC, but BISC helps orchestrate it. So you can see that process here waiting for blockchain confirmation. That's going to be your deposit transaction with Bitcoin, the Bitcoin being traded, and your security deposits from both buyer and seller. We'll talk more about that in a second. So check, that's done. You maybe wait 10 minutes for that. Two, start payment. So that's BISC telling you, the buyer, go to your banking website, log in, and send 1,200 euros to this IBAN with this first and last name. You've gotten just enough information about your counterparty to settle this trade, right? So you do that, and then you wait, right? Because banks are slow, much, much, much slower than blockchains, much, much slower than Bitcoin, right? Might take, depending on the payment method, it might take an hour or a day or even a few days uh, for, say, a SEPA transfer like we're talking about here. Okay, and then the next thing is that the seller does receive your, your payments, and on the seller's side, in their BISC client, they click a button that says, I received the payment, right? Then on your side, you're going to see a notification from BISC saying, okay, the trade is complete, the seller got the funds, you two have worked together to release the Bitcoin to you, the buyer. We'll talk a little bit more about how that happens in a second. And the trade is finished, and you can withdraw those Bitcoin to a different wallet, or you can leave it in BISC. BISC is also a complete wallet. So that's an overview of the process, but let's break that down a little bit and talk about how trading with BISC is, is different than other forms of uh, trading Bitcoin. So the first thing is that there's no automatic order matching. Right? When you use a centralized exchange, you typically say, I want to buy this much Bitcoin, for, and it instantly, instantly happens. Your account is credited with that Bitcoin. The fiat side of your accounts at that exchange is debited for that amount. And the reason that that's possible is because of automatic order matching. That centralized service is providing a lot of value. Right? Centralized Bitcoin exchanges are really convenient and really nice. Uh, but they're doing that because they're managing that, that offer book or that order book uh, in a centralized way. So BISC doesn't work that way, right? It's purely peer-to-peer. -peer. You're looking for some particular person's uh, offer to sell or they're going to take your offer to buy or whatever it is. So no automatic order matching. The BISC protocol, like I mentioned, coordinates out-of-band fiat payments. So like I said, you're going to have to go log into your banking website or whatever other payment method you two have agreed on. And ultimately, settlement, like what it takes to complete the trade, that's what I mean by settlement, it takes longer with BISC, that's different, but in return, the trade-off that you're making is that it's a far more secure, far more private, and far more censorship resistant uh, uh, way to complete that trade. So if that's attractive to you, you would want to use BISC, right? If you're a day trader who's trading f 5, 10, 15, 20 times a day, BISC wouldn't be a very friendly platform for you. You would want to use something centralized, probably. But if you're trying to get in or trying to get out of Bitcoin, if you're trying to get into Bitcoin for the first time, say, right, BISC would be a very attractive platform for people who are uh, privacy conscious. Okay, so how does BISC actually fulfill these things? How does BISC keep your funds secure? Well, the first is that BISC is entirely non-custodial. What does that mean? It means we never, ever hold on to your funds. This is like the prime directive. This is like rule number one in Bitcoin. If you don't have the keys, you don't have the Bitcoin, right? You never, ever, ever give your Bitcoin away to somebody else, to a trusted third party. So BISC doesn't violate that. Centralized exchanges do. BISC respects this uh, important part of uh, sort of Bitcoin's philosophy. If Bitcoin's motto is be your own bank, then BISC's motto is be your own exchange, right? And that means you've got to hold on to your funds uh, the whole time and never is it in, in, in our control, right? The second thing is security deposits from both buyer and seller. So both buyer and seller are going to put in a little bit of Bitcoin in addition to the Bitcoin actually being traded as a way of ensuring that, if some, that nobody acts badly, right? We can talk more about that in a second too. Those security deposits, along with the Bitcoin being traded, are locked away in a multi-signature transaction on the Bitcoin blockchain, which some will have heard of. That might be new to people. But if you're familiar with the idea of escrow, like when you buy a house, you make this very expensive purchase, 
and you don't trust the person that you're buying the house from to just hold hundreds of thousands of euros. So you put that with an escrow company, usually, right? A trusted third party. Well, one thing that blockchain technology and Bitcoin in particular makes possible that wasn't really possible before is the idea of trustless escrow. So we put that, we, BISC helps coordinating putting the Bitcoin being traded and those security deposits away in a so-called deposit transaction that requires multiple signatures, signatures from you, the buyer, and the seller, in order to spend that Bitcoin out. So that, that, those funds, those, th that deposit transaction is going to remain locked away in that multi-sig transaction until the seller clicks that button that says, I got, I got the euros. And when he clicks that button, the two BISC clients are going to work together to sign out that deposit transaction. That's a little technical, right? But uh, the point is, uh, your funds are never in the control of a third party. The only place that they're ever living is either in your BISC clients or safely locked away on the Bitcoin blockchain. The final thing is that BISC includes a decentralized arbitration system as well. Right? It's one thing to, to design a system like this. You know, so far, we've gone through the happy path. Right? What, what it looks like when it goes well. But what happens if a mistake was made along the way? What if, uh, what if you as the buyer sent the wrong amount to the seller or you accidentally wrote the wrong name in the payment details or you sent it to the wrong IBAN or you sent it too late or you never sent it at all, right? What if the seller never clicks that button that says I got your money even though you sent the money? Right? So all kinds of mistakes can happen. And of course, there can also be bad actors in a system like this. So uh, these are the kinds of things that no amount of code can really solve. So we have to have human arbitration in a system like this. And that's why BISC in incorporates a complete uh, decentralized arbitration system as well to handle disputes. OK, so that's how BISC helps keep your funds secure. Right? How does BISC help keep your data private? Well, the first thing is that there's no registration. There's no identity verification. Uh, like I explained before, you won't have to be sending anybody photos of your passport with BISC. Uh, the second is that every BISC application, every client is a Tor hidden service. So for most people, uh, most people probably haven't run a Tor hidden service. Probably a disproportionately large number of people here have. But most people would, will never actually experience running a Tor hidden service. But with BISC, it's just out of the bo box it works, right? Um, and there's no uh, central servers or databases uh, that we're maintaining that record any data. We couldn't record it if we tried uh, because everything is quite private. Again, it's just between you and your counterparty when you agree to settle a trade with each other or to take a trade with each other. Okay, so how does BISC help you resist uh, censorship, right? Or how is BISC censorship resistant? Well. The first thing is that we're dealing with a fully decentralized, even a fully distributed peer-to-peer -peer network, right? Again, every single person on the BISC network is running that client, so that's a fully distributed peer-to-peer -peer network. Uh, and that's, on its own, pretty hard to shut down, right? That's the nature of, of these kinds of networks. Uh, the second thing is that uh, BISC inherits, in a way, Tor's own censorship resistant, resistance, right? Because everybody's running a Tor hidden service, running on top of Tor, we inherit all the benefits of that. You inherit all the benefits of that. And the third thing is that BISC isn't structured as a, a company or other kind of legal entity. It's not a foundation. It's not a Verein. It's none of that. It's just code. So BISC is just code that individual people are choosing to run. Uh, and we know by precedent from things like BitTorrent, say, that's pretty hard to shut down. So far, code isn't illegal. Right? And it's up to all of us to keep it that way. And the way we keep it that way is by claiming our rights and running code like this. So where are we? Right? What's the current status of this? Um, it's been in production since April of 2016. Uh, we've been developing it, like I said, since basically just after Mt. Gox failed. So that's already almost four years in development. It took about two, two and a half years to develop and test it completely uh, before we were comfortable going live on Bitcoin's uh, main net or the main Bitcoin blockchain. Uh, but we did that in April of 2016, so that's about 20 months ago. 
uh, as I speak. And there, there you're just looking at, uh, that's the monthly chart of uh, you know, uh, how much Bitcoin moved through the network. And there's 20 bars there, right? So 20 months of uh, Biscuit production so far. And during that time, we've processed thousands of trades worth millions of dollars uh, of Bitcoin, right? Sort of the dollar value of Bitcoin, if you measure it that way. Uh, and we've had no downtime and we've had no major incidents. So BISC is still small, very small by comparison to the biggest centralized exchanges out there in the world. Uh, but we've been growing steadily. And this chart is showing you, uh, again, the US dollar value of all the Bitcoin that's moved through the exchange at the current uh, you know, exchange rate for Bitcoin to US dollars. So if you look at the left side there in April of 2016, we did about $30,000 worth of Bitcoin trading, um, otherwise known as nothing <laughs> by comparison to, to big exchanges, right? But you see that trend line uh, moving through it, we've doubled that, that volume uh, about every three and a half to four months since April of 2016. And that's, you know, that's actually an exponential curve. And we've been tracking to that curve pretty well. This chart that you're looking at is uh, up to date as of September. Uh, this is the chart from the last two months. So the fully accurate chart this last month was a pretty wild ride. We went from doing uh, about, you know, $500,000 months to doing $500,000 days, uh, all of a sudden. Uh, and that's due to a few reasons, but the biggest reason is just everything that's been going on in Bitcoin land. So uh, if you follow this space, you've probably heard about how most, if not all, of the major uh, centralized exchanges have just been uh, totally overwhelmed by you know, the, the, the influx of new users and so on, um, just crumbling under the, under the load of you know, even, even shutting down new user accounts and so on, turning people away. Well, we got a little, a little taste of that. Fortunately, we didn't shut, shut anything down. We didn't turn anybody away. We were actually able to do quite a bit of trading, uh, even though it was pretty intense. Uh, and so, so let's talk about how BISC is funded, right? How do we keep this whole thing running? It's free software, right? Like, you know, f both free as in beer and free as in speech. You can just download and run BISC. And obviously, it's, G you know, AGPL licensed. But actually trading on BISC does cost something, right? So we charge trading fees. And uh, where those trading fees go are directly to the arbitrators, right? So one way to think about what you're paying for when you pay to trade on BISC is you're paying for the security that those arbitrators provide. Uh, even if the arbitrator doesn't have anything to do with that particular trade, even if your trade is a kind of happy path trade, you never would have engaged in that trade in the first place if you didn't have the reassurance knowing that there's an arbitrator there if something does go wrong. So that's the kind of value model behind our trading fees. Uh, and those fees uh, have averaged about one Bitcoin per month. And up until this last month or so, that wasn't enough to pay the bills. <laughs> Over the last month, the price has gone up so high that actually could start to pay the bills. But primarily, it's been funded out of pocket. Uh, you know, we've been growing and, 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 and making a bit more money as we go, but it hasn't been enough. Maybe we're starting to turn that corner now. Uh, but the problem is that there's been no decentralized way to compensate all the other contributors that, uh, that do all of the other things with BISC, right? All of the coding, all of the, you know, uh, monitoring uh, IRC and Reddit and, you know, updating documentation and all of the things that aren't arbitration. Uh, there's been no clear way to, to compensate those, com those, those contributors in a decentralized way. And I'm mentioning that here because I'm going to talk in a moment about uh, the BISC DAO, right? So more on that in a moment. But these are some of the issues that we're currently dealing with and that we've designed solutions to, but that are in the process of being rolled out. Uh, so that's funding, right? So how is BISC governed? How has BISC been governed so far, right? Again, this is all changing right now. But up until very recently, it's been a small team of contributors. Uh, it's been centralized uh, maintenance, arbitra excuse me, administration and operation. What does that mean? It just means that small group of, of, of developers and contributors are the ones that are responsible for all the code changes and so on. Uh, the founders have primarily been the key decision makers, right? And there's just a couple of founders. So that's already quite a bit of centralization, right? These are all risks 
when it comes to censorship resistance, right? When you have centralization of decision making and funding and so on, that makes you weak with regard to censorship resistance. So that's why it's so important for us to solve this problem. And so you can think about it this way, right? BISC's technology is decentralized, really qu quite well decentralized. Uh, but BISC's governance hasn't been so far. BISC's, BISC's government, go governance has largely, largely been centralized. So where are we in the, in the mission that I talked about earlier then? Well, I said our mission is to, is to provide secure, private, censorship-resistant uh, way you know, to exchange Bitcoin for, for national and cryptocurrencies. Well, I think it's roughly safe to check the box on secure and private. Right? This is never perfect. It can always be better. Uh, but we think we've done a pretty good job of that. Certainly better than the alternatives that are out there. Uh, but with regard to censorship resistance, like I say, there's work to be done. So the peer-to-peer the -peer network over Tor, right? that goes a long way towards censorship resistance. That's great. But decentralized funding... Up until very recently, we hadn't made a lot of progress in that. And decentralized governance, we hadn't made a lot of progress in that. So what we need now and what we're up to now is continued trading volume growth, right? If, if a growing number of people don't continue to use BISC, then it'll probably never become economically viable, right? It'll always be a very tiny, uh, just open source project kind of struggling to get by. But the good news is, you've seen that trend line. It seems to be going pretty well. Uh, the second thing, and this is really the most important thing, and especially to an audience like this, is to scale up contributions, right? Scale up the group of, of people that are contributing to BISC, working on BISC, working with us through GitHub and, you know, sort of all of the normal state-of-the-art tools uh, in order to obviously improve BISC, but to help continue fostering that growth, right? Uh, the BISC that we have today wouldn't be able to scale up 10x, 100x, right? If for no other reason, then we only have a handful of arbitrators right now. So we need more people who can do arbitration, for example, in order to really, really scale up, uh, you know, to uh, kind of uh, the, the level, anything near centralized exchanges like we know them today. Uh, we need a decentralized compensation model to incentivize all those other contributors that I just talked about. And we need a, de a decentralized responsibility model to avoid censorship, right? So if there's just one or two heads to cut off, then there's a decent risk that they will be cut off. But th if there's a whole bunch of people that are responsible for you know, all the pieces and parts of what it means to operate and administer and maintain BISC and its network, then that's a whole lot harder to shut down. So we have under the DAO, right, which I'm going to explain in just a moment, our governance becomes decentralized too. That's the idea. So what is the BISC DAO? How many people have heard of this term, DAO? Yeah, okay, that's like approaching half. Um, for those that don't know, it stands for Decentralized Autonomous Organization. Uh, and this is, this is an emerging concept in the, in the kind of crypto space, right? You can think of it as what happens to the idea of corporations when you have things like cryptocurrency in the mix. Uh, we, we start to see a kind of new economic entity start to show up. Corporations were an, were an innovation three or four hundred years ago. We may now have a new kind of innovation in how to organize ourselves and how to structure ourselves to work together effectively. And the idea of a DAO is uh, the kind of leading set of ideas around that. So this talk that I'm giving here is a, a modified version of a longer talk that I gave uh, some months ago in, uh, in Prague. And uh, so there's a number of slides here that I'm going to move through pretty quickly because I want to make sure that there's time for, for questions and we just have about 10 more minutes. Um, but for those that are interested, right, you've now seen the overview of BISC, why it exists, what it's for, a little bit about how it feels to use it. What I'm going to talk about now is a very quick overview of the DAO. It'll be a little bit like kind of breakneck pace, but if you want to find out more, there will be a link at the end of this uh, to a paper that we call Phase Zero, a plan for bootstrapping the BISC DAO. And if you want to dig into that, that's a, that's a great read and you can find out all about it and then you can come, uh, come talk to us about it and hopefully contribute and participate. But in any case, uh, how this DAO works is we introduce a new token that we call BSQ, 
which is kind of like our name, BISQ is BISC's name. But BSQ is a token that's designed to facilitate a transfer of value from traders, i.e. users of the platform, people who find BISC valuable. BISC, BSQ is designed to transfer value from traders who use BISC to the contributors who are maintaining it. And the way that uh, BISC works, that BSQ works, is that uh, the 25 Bitcoin that uh, supporters have donated to the project since its inception, right, four years ago, we distribute those 25 Bitcoin uh, to all of the past contributors by cutting up the Bitcoin into tiny pieces, a thousand Satoshis large, it's a very small amount of Bitcoin, and the way the math works out there is we turn 25 Bitcoin into 2.5 million BSQ. We then distribute those 2.5 million BSQ to all of the past contributors, like I say, who ever helped BISC you know, uh, come into existence and, uh, and, and be the project that it is today. This, uh, this process is called, uh, this idea of BSQ, it's a colored coin. And some, have may, some may have heard of this. Uh, that's very different than uh, the tokens and kind of ICO stuff that we see today um, so commonly. A colored, coin in the, a colored coin on top of Bitcoin actually is Bitcoin, but with additional validation rules, additional things being possible with that coin. Uh, so again, I won't go into a lot of detail, but it's very important to say that this is not an ICO. <laughs> There is no crowd sale, there is no pre-mine, there is no crowdfunding, none of that stuff. Uh, we simply don't need it. So again, it's a token designed to facilitate a transfer of value between the traders who use BISC and the contributors who maintain it. And uh, I'll just very quickly click through this again. I want to be able to take questions. Um, let's see. The main problem is that the flow of funds goes only to arbitrators like I talked about and there's no way to compensate contributors in a decentralized way right now. So that's where BSQ comes in uh, and we have five uh, functions or utilities of this token. And the first one is trading, right? People can trade BSQ like if you're, you know, you can trade it for dollars or euros or what, or Bitcoin, right? On BISC, of course, that's where you can trade it. Uh, the second function is spending it. People spend BSQ on uh, trading fees, right? So as I explained before, you pay in Bitcoin today for trading fees. As we enable this functionality, you'll be able to pay for those same trading fees at a discounted rate with BSQ, which gives traders an incentive to hold on to it or to, uh, or to buy it in the first place. The third function is earning, right? So contributors submit what we call compensation requests for a, a given amount of BSQ to compensate them for whatever they did that month. And the fourth function is voting. So people who already have BSQ use that BSQ as a kind of voting chip. That's the fourth function of the token. And they use that voting to green light or to reject compensation requests. So stakeholders decide who gets new BSQ. And the fifth function is bonding. So for roles in the DAO that are uh, inherently high trust, right? Something like an arbitrator. That's a very high trust role. A, a, a bad actor arbitrator could wreak terrible havoc on BISC and its network. Uh, so, we ha so the fifth function of BSQ is that high trust roles can bond in BSQ, can put up a very large amount of BSQ, and that BSQ can be confiscated if that uh, arbitrator, say, or other kind of bonded contributor trusted role if they act badly. Okay, so again, a whole lot here that I'm moving very quickly through, but you can find it all in the paper. Uh, and I'll skip the bit on uh, issuance and destruction, even though it's my favorite slide in this whole thing. No time to talk about it. Um, okay, so let me leave it at that. Uh, you can find, again, all of this is in the paper. This is adapted directly from the paper that I mentioned. And let me just go to this last slide where you can find out more. So we're BISC underscore network on Twitter. Uh, I'm C Beams on Twitter. And uh, of course you can download it. Uh, if you want to join us in Slack, come hang out, uh, talk to us about anything you like. There's, an, there's a link for that. Uh, the phase zero paper is that link. So just bisc.network slash phase dash zero. And of course we're on GitHub at bisc-network. So that's, I think we have 
Five, maybe 10 minutes? Five minutes, okay. Yeah, so. Who's the first? What's with? Can users um, define their own settlement times? Like for SIPA, for example, you have about eight business days of reversal risk. Um, and I saw like, uh, on your example, you had like five days of, of settlement time, which is not enough to, to exclude a reversal risk. Yeah, so the, 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 I think the question is about how long is the kind of window uh, for settling a trade? No, but I can actually set in my offer as a seller. Uh, can you set it? Yes. No. Yeah. So, so in the if you if you caught it in the in the slide that I was showing, uh, for SEPA trades, there's a number of days that you have right to settle the trade. That's fixed. Uh, so the seller can't specify that, but it's fixed at uh, you know five days or whatever it is, simply because that's what we found works well uh, over time. Uh, the internal SEPA regulations say it's eight days, business days. Yeah, 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 we're not following that. It's a pragmatic approach where we're saying if we set it at this many days, we never have problems. If we started having problems, then we'd extend it. So, okay. yeah. Thank you. I have a couple of questions. So, yeah. I didn't really understand if you do crypto to crypto as well. We do, yeah. So, uh, so I, I focused on talking about. Uh, crypto fiat, right, or Bitcoin to US dollars, Bitcoin to Euro, that kind of, that kind of trading, because that's really the core of Bitcoin. Like, the, really the core of the mission is to give people, there has to be one good on-ramp into Bitcoin uh, from the fiat world, and that really doesn't exist today. The, the only thing you can do is go to a Satoshi Square or have a friend or a family member who already has Bitcoin. If, if you do that, if you do something like in person like that, then you can have a reasonably good sort of privacy and security profile in that initial trade to get into Bitcoin. But there has been no good way to do that online. And so that's really why BISC exists. But once we had done that, then it was pretty easy to add in crypto to crypto trading as well. Because if you think about it, like I said, payment, settling the payment happens out of band, right? So you're going to your bank website and so on. Well, that's for a Bitcoin to Euro trade. Well, if you want to do a Bitcoin to Monero trade, Monero is really just a different payment method, right? So you're going to settle the Monero side outside, out of band from BISC as well. Uh, so it, that, that's kind of a good way to think about it. But the, the, the constraint there is that one side of every trade is, is Bitcoin. Uh, so, you know, go, I had someone ask me today about uh, doing, a, you know, an Ether to Doge, Dogecoin. Uh, trade on BISC, and that's not supported. It would be a two-step process, right, to go from Doge to Bitcoin, Bitcoin to Ether, or something like that. Ah, okay, so <clears throat> if I wanted to sell some ERC-20 token, I cannot just go and list it there unless I accept fiat. No, well, so the two things. So if you wanted to sell an ERC-20 token, if, uh, it, it, the question is, is that already a listed uh, token on BISC? Who right? lists the tokens? Anybody who issues a pull request. Okay. So you have to issue a correct pull request and we'll always merge it. So okay, anybody cool. can add a token and people do that all the time. So that's it, yeah. Okay. Um, as a seller, uh, is there a way for me to automate confirmations through some kind of API from my bank if I'm selling like uh, larger volumes? So I don't have to go and confirm manually in BISC that yes, I received the money to my account? Is there some way? Uh, so we d so BISC does have an API that can automate a lot of things, but there's not we don't have we don't have a set. <laughs> you got to take the mic away from her, man. <laughs> uh, but we don't have we don't have you know sort of like bindings into all of the different banks and stuff like that. Again, mostly they don't have APIs to do it. But even if they do, we don't have that support. That could be something that somebody contributes for banks that do support automated access, but we don't have it yet. Anybody else? Yeah. Hey, great talk. Um, question: you, you, in your paper, you use the term bonding. Is it is it some kind of stake mechanism? The term, sorry. Bonding. Bonding. Yeah. Yeah. Is it uh, some kind of stake, or is it something else, or? Something? Yeah. So the question is, when I use the word bonding with BSQ for these high trust roles under the BISC DAO, do I mean like 
stake or staking or having something at stake. That's, that's another term in the industry that people use is staking. Yes, I mean the same thing. We call it bonding because there's a long history of, you know, say, uh, plumbers uh, guild, well, you know, bonded plumbers, right, or bonded taxi drivers or whatever it is. That's a common term of art. Uh, and the second thing is it's a reserved word for us because we have stakeholders. People who hold BSQ are our stakeholders, so we didn't want to confuse stakeholders with staking. Yeah, same thing, though. Okay, thank you very much. Cool. I'll be around at the Bitcoin table, so happy to answer questions. I will, I will ask you and you oh. can explain. Oh, great. Okay. Uh, Chris Beam, I'm so sorry. Chris Beam, Beams, Beams, even. Yeah. Plural. I'm so sorry. To, no more questions. Out of time. The next talk starts in five minutes. But where can all these wonderful people find you and uh, torture you with even more questions? Yeah, so bisc.network is a website, bisc underscore network on Twitter, and I'll be at the Bitcoin table pretty much all conference. So, Okay, guys, you know. Cheers, thanks. <laughs>